Welcome to the Carl Nelson Show on Washington, D.C.'s 1450 WOL Radio and live around the world on WOLDCnews.com. And thank you for joining us today, folks. Uh, later on, psychiatrist Dr. Frances Quest Ralton will be here. She's going to invite us into her classroom to talk about the black bourgeoisie or the black upper class. And the question is, can they identify with the urban struggle? You know, this, this conversation started with a young man at Mizzou uh, when they found out who was on the hunger strike, by the way, and they found out his family was, was pretty well off. His dad's a, a millionaire, and, you know, it didn't seem like the starving student. But uh, does, that, does that make a difference? Uh, so we're going to get uh, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson to talk about that. Also, Dick Gregory is going to join us. He's going to give us his take on the Paris bombings. Before we get to Greg, uh, the only African-American psychologist in the NBA, Dr. Ramel Smith, is here. We're going to talk about the social consciousness of uh, athletes. Also, later this week, uh, though, we, Dr. Donna Mertram Rutgers, uh, historian, is going to be with us. Uh, she's going to talk about the, the activity on, on college campuses these days. And also Craig Hewlett. Oh, boy, Craig is going to give us his take on what's going on. Won the presidential race. You know, he says he's going to be Jeb Bush. Jeb's look like he's, and if it's a horse race, he's faltering down the stretch. But maybe he still can make up time. Also, we're going to get his take uh, on what's going on, what went on in Paris as well, and ISIS and Iceland, or whatever they call themselves these days. Also, before the end of the week, the man with the plan. One of our power talkers, Dr. Claude Anderson, is going to be here. We're going to get his take, too, about the immigration. Well, you basically know what his, his take is on immigration. But now with, with Syria, with all these immigrants coming in, we'll see what Dr. Anderson says. So that's Dr. Anderson, uh, Dr. Donna Murch, uh, uh, Craig Hewlett, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson today, and also Dick Gregory. So tell your friends to keep it locked on 1450 WOL. And again, if you missed any of the shows, just go to the WOL uh, WLDC News, the WOL website. Uh, just look at the search bar on the top right hand corner. Just put in Carl Nelson Show uh, podcast, and you can, uh, and it will direct you to where you can hear some of the shows if you miss some of the guests that we have. But right now, let's welcome Doctor Smith to to WOL. Doctor Smith, good morning, and welcome to WOL Radio. Hey, thanks for having me on, Brother Nelson. Well, good to have you. You know, interesting. We found out you were the only African American psychologist in the NBA. Uh, tell us about your journey. Where did you go to school, and, and it was this was this uh, the destined path, or did you sort of stumble into it? Well, you know what? Um, it was something definitely that I didn't even have on my radar, if I'm being perfectly honest. I um, grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so um, growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, if you, you look at the stats, I grew up actually in a zip code 53206. In the 53206, um, if you looked at any of the social media sites within the board, that is by far the worst area code to grow up as a black American male in America. Uh, by far, and they look at those statistics by saying, what's the educational opportunity? Then they say not only what are the educational opportunities, but what's the employment opportunity? And then on top of that, what's the incarceration rate? So in a state like Wisconsin, where black people make up roughly 6% of the state, but we house over 49% of the prison population, uh, you know, this was my destiny growing up. And if I'm just being in full disclosure, I didn't escape all of those uh, different traps that was there. I almost didn't make it. Um, I'm uh, not only Dr. Smith, but I'm also 298082. And that was my uh, inmate number. And I never went to prison. Um, I was lucky enough to only to get 18 months probation. But I say that to say this. There's a lot of obstacles, a lot of traps to maneuver out through uh, coming in there. So for me, I just not to be dead, not to be in jail, not to be unemployed or underemployed really was the goal, to be perfectly honest, coming up. Oh. Uh, before you go on, it says something. Do you remember those numbers that they assigned to you? And, and, oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. and you, were, you said you're only on probation? Yeah, 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 yeah. You still get a number because if something happens, you know, obviously you go to prison. And so it's just a reminder, you know, and it was like I wasn't um, in a position um, where I had to do um, a, a, a ton of time, which some people do when sometimes being incarcerated, you know, can get a person institutionalized, things of that nature. But it's just a, um, a, a testimony to what goes on in our country where even good people can get caught up. You know, so, so when we talk about what are the obstacles for a young person, especially a black male, or growing up, um, I wasn't like the, you know, the young man you just talked about from Missouri. Didn't grow up with some of the economic privileges. So you say, you know, how did you get on this path? But, you know, true enough, that's why I am where I am today. Because once you go through certain, certain tests, once you go through certain trials, 
it builds you up for something. So there's two things you can do. You can complain about it and do nothing and let the situation persist. Or you can say, you know what, I am going to do something about this. I'm going to make sure that what happened to me doesn't happen to somebody else so easily. So um, one of the things my grandmother taught me, she said the best way to heal yourself is to help others. And that was something that I took to heart. So when going back to school, my goal was just to be a school psychologist, to work inside the school system, inside the, the city and do something positive. Working as a school psychologist, going back to school, um, I got my uh, master's degree, and then I got my doctorate in psychology. And as I was working in the schools, I had to do an internship, and I ended up working in the prison system. Working in the prison system was really ironic, actually, having a number. So I could have a lot in common with the young men and the young women that I encountered that I spoke with. I'm working with the prison. Um, I worked there for five years, and I absolutely loved it. But the only thing was I was already working with people who had had the strike against them, who had had that, you know, that scarlet letter of an F already on their chest. You know, I got to see the recidivation firsthand. People come in, leave, come back out, go in, come out, go in, come out. And it got pretty frustrating. Uh, so there, uh, my path took me to a children's hospital where I worked in the trauma department. And working in the trauma department, I got to work with those people who were chronically um, abused, those people who were sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, taken out of their homes, parents in prison or jail or dead. They were placed in foster care and kinship care, something of the like. And um, it's just like, I was like, is this all there is? I was like, so many of the people who I worked in prison, I was working with their children, but those people that I was working with in prison had the same type of um, kind of background as those young people who I was working with. So you was like, you know, I kind of started to think, uh, oh, Martin Luther King said, are we are, uh, uh, quote, you know, are we in the business of criminalizing poverty? And, you know, those things start to affect you. And so I started my own business. And to start my own business, Blacksmith Psychological Consultation Services, I began to work with different entities, you know, with the police department, uh, with the federal government, uh, within the school system, trying to see who I could talk to and who I could help. So in doing this, um, I created um, a, a local television show on our access cable channel, trying to provide information to help. And this is to answer your question. So one day out the blue, I get a call from the Milwaukee Bucks. And they're uh, looking for someone to come in and to be able to help uh, with the young man. And so um, I go in, I speak with them. Uh, things go pretty good. They put me on on a consultant basis. I'm helping out basically with the draft, you know, kind of helping to uh, interview the young man and see exactly, you know, uh, what they can provide to the team. If they are brought to the team, what would be the services that they would need to help them maximize their potential. Um, we had a change in those people who I uh, was leading the team. Uh, with that came a coaching change. And with our new coach and our current coach, uh, he had a different type of vision. And he said um, he wanted to do something that, that he had had in the past and have somebody on in a full-time capacity. And he asked me if I would be willing to do that. And uh, once we sat down and we talked and I saw that, you know, I was in um, in unison in concert with his thoughts. I was right. Like, Hang on a second, Dr. Smith. we got to step aside for we have a traffic update. First of the morning for our folks in the DMV. Yes, Dr. Ramel Smith is our guest. As I mentioned, he's the only African-American psychologist in the NBA with the Milwaukee Bucks. We'll take your phone calls for him after this traffic update on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. Good morning. This traffic update is brought to you by the Foundation for a Better Life. We have an early morning crash now, 50 heading inbound right at Kenilworth Avenue. The right lane is taken away. Your delays from that accident this morning begin from 202 DC 295. Stop and go travel southbound from Burroughs Avenue to Pennsylvania Avenue and on the BW Parkway sluggish now from 410 heading southbound all the way into the 5295 split. Winston Churchill's word, serve his country in the face of defeat. Today they inspire us to reach for our own victories. Commit but pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. This weather update is brought to you by understood.org and the Ad Council. Visit understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help you help your child thrive in school and life. Understood.org because understanding is everything. Today, cooler with some clouds and sun highs reaching the mid 60s. Mostly cloudy tonight, lows near 50. Some clouds right now and 47 degrees. I'm Tony Thornton for News Talk 1450 WOL, where information is power.
Like the taste of fresh apples? Try an Angry Orchard hard cider. At Angry Orchard, we believe in tradition. That's why we use apples from a hundred-year-old orchard. It takes two apples to make each bottle of Angry Orchard. So raise a glass to a time when apples were best served in a pint glass. Angry Orchard, when you're looking for something a little different. Crisp, refreshing, and not too sweet. Just like me. Angry Orchard hard cider. Right. Yeah. Angry Richard Cider Company, Cincinnati, Ohio. Drink responsibly. Those of us who were around in the 50s and 60s struggling, many of us have gotten tired, and we let the enemy have his way. Well, I did my best, they'll say, and you all take it now. I'm just going to sit down and relax or retire. I have never seen a lion retire from being a lion. I may not bite as hard as I used to, but I can still bite. Don't miss the Farrakhan Speaks broadcast. This and every Sunday at 8 a.m. until 9 a.m. right here on WOL 1450 a.m. Where information is power. That's the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on the air this Sunday at 8 a.m. If you missed last Sunday's message, you have to hear him this Sunday. Don't miss it. GSA Auctions is holding a one-of-a-kind sale on behalf of the U.S. Marshal Service of over 2,000 new high-end designer gowns and other wedding wear seized earlier this year. This unique opportunity runs November 18th through the 20th at the Embassy Suites Baltimore Hotel in Linthicum, Maryland. Gowns and accessories from designers like Badgley Mishka, Alfred Angelo, and David Tutera will be offered at 40 to 60% off. Go to GSAauctions.gov for all the details. Carl Nelson live and local from 6 to 10 a.m. on 1450 WOL. Thank you for staying with us, folks. 12 after the hour with our guest, Dr. Amel Smith. As I mentioned, he's the only black psychologist in the NBA. He's working with the Milwaukee Bucks. And Dr. Smith, I'm going to let you continue your, your journey, your, your story of your journey before we, we get on and take some calls for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we were, uh, I'm at the point where we was like I started to talk with the new coach of the team. He had a, an ideal of what he wanted to do, how he wanted to um, help with players. And I tell you, uh, Brother Carl, it was, it was a real tough decision for me because I was, um, you know, especially pointed to what you're talking about today as far as activism and thing. And I was like, obviously taking this position, it was going to take a lot of time away uh, from me and the community. I was going to be doing a lot of traveling with the team, be with the team. And as you know, uh, the NBA season is unforgiving. You don't rest. You know, it's seven days a week. There are no weekends. There are no holidays. You know, we play on Christmas. We play on the day after Christmas. So that's a travel day. And so in doing that, I was like, well, what would happen with me inside of the city? You know, what would happen, you know, if I'm not able to do all of the things I did? And one of the ways I was able to reconcile this in my mind is this. I was like, I was going to be able to touch some young men who are in a very, very impressionable um, stage and also that would have a different power and ability than even myself with whatever letter that may have behind my name. They have an extremely uh, important voice. And, and a larger microphone where their voice can be amplified. And I said, if I could do my job and just in a small way put my fingerprints on them to help them to maximize and be the best person who they can be, then I was going to have a lot of reverberations on who they talk to as far as the young people, as far as some of the people their age group. And people, uh, you know, just be honest, even older people who still look up at least, I knew if I could do that, that I would be able to have a mission. And even uh, with this, you know, working uh, with the team that has some perks. Um, and, you know, I am the only African-American uh, full-time psychologist with the team, but I will give the NBA uh, a little credit. There are a lot more African-American men working in mentor roles that are pseudo-psychologists, maybe don't have the title, but uh, they do uh, work very, very hard uh, with the team. I have some, some colleagues when I go around for league issues, I mean, I talk with that, that do a lot of things with the team. So, our whole mission, our whole goal is to help these young men, obviously, to maximize themselves on the court, but more importantly, maximize themselves as individuals, as people. So when they're off the court, they can uh, make not only uh, themselves proud, the family proud, but the community and, and uh, the world proud in general. Now, do all teams, all professional uh, uh, athletic teams, do they have a psychologist on, on staff? You know what? Unfortunately, no. You know, you have we have probably about 15 teams that have um, psychologists um, on the team, some in varying degrees. 
a very few are full time. You know, mental health is taboo, and in the world of uh, sports, you know, we're still very hyper masculine. Um, it becomes even more taboo, you know, in uh, how people look at that and, and wondering, you know, what was going on. And when you start dealing with uh, individuals where you have millions of dollars on the line, nobody ever wants to admit that there, you know, could be something wrong, especially that could affect their potential earning when they have such a small window to earn a mass amount of money that they have the ability to earn at this time. Oh, wow. Uh, and do you, do you do you consult only the players or the other members of the staff on on the team? Uh, do they come to you as well with issues? Well, you know what? See, I have a, a varying role. So it's like um, as, a, as a sports psychologist, you do so many different things. So it could be counseling, but it could also be uh, just, you know, literal performance issues, you know, how to improve communication skills, how to improve uh, leadership ability, you know, recognizing different skills of that nature. So those things are transferable not only – uh, to the players, but also to um, everybody that can be within the organization. Um, but, you know, it's just like this. You know, it's like in my family. Uh, everybody knows I'm a psychologist. So if there is a question, something to shoot through, you know, people will come through me, you know, sometimes with hypotheticals and what ifs, and that doesn't change in the business realm either. And these young men who are coming in, in, into the NBA, some coming out straight out of high school, you know, is there any common issue that they have? Well, well, now they can't come straight out of high school. You know, they have a rule where you at least have to do one year post high school, sort of like the NFL has three years uh, removed out of, out of high school. The NBA has one year. And, and no, you know what? Everybody manifests uh, with different issues because people come from different backgrounds. You have some men, uh, young men, who are, you know, like the, their father played in the NBA. So, you know, their life from a, a financial standpoint was, was very different. But, you know, some people sometimes mistake financial prosperity to mean a privileged life, or sometimes that's not the case because, you know, problems come in all packages. So when you talk about, you know, an individual coming in, they all come in with their own individual stories and their own issues and their own strengths. Right. And, and, you know, back to what we saw on the University of Missouri where, where the football players stood up and, you know, the applaud across black America was long and, and hard and strong. And, and I'm I'm just wondering, is that indicative of the new uh, athlete? You, you, and just just from your you know your vantage point, are you, is cause for the longest we saw that they since I guess since uh, Tommy Smith and and Ali in that group in the '60s, the black athlete uh, sort of went dormant uh, as far as social issues were concerned. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, even if we look at Missouri, and I give all credit to those young athletes for standing up, but. It wasn't the football team that initiated, you know, the issues. You know, it was, it was, you know, the students. And then joined in by faculty and everything. And things were going on. But what happened was it wasn't until the black uh, football players chimed in with their voices that things were amplified, that people started paying attention. Cameras came. And when attention came and once the boys started talking about they weren't going to play, let's be honest, it wasn't that they really wanted to, uh, to concede to those demands. But it became a financial issue. And so in America, you know, it's a capitalistic society. If it makes dollars, it makes sense. If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. So for the university, they were compelled to listen, not because they really cared, uh, but because, you know, it was becoming a financial concern. It was becoming an embarrassment, which could have, you know, financial ramifications with alumni and also with future students uh, willing to come. So like I said, I applaud those football players, but it wasn't them, you know, who in fact who began it. It was their voice that helped to amplify the message. And I think that goes uh, to your, you know, your original question. What has happened, you know, to that, to that, to that black athlete that was so socially conscious? And, you know, the, the league and, and every other place has a way of showing people what happened to you uh, when you do become socially conscious. You know, there's a way of being possibly placed out of the league. You know, there's a time for you to say, hey, this is a privilege to be in this position. If you cause too much trouble, it may not be good for you. And unless you have, uh, you know, the type of name, if you're not the face of the NBA or have that type of weight, it's very difficult for your voice to go very far. You know, and they understand that. They understand that as it relates to brand, as it relates to endorsements, things of that nature. And so that's where it comes to the thing, what am I willing to do? What am I willing to say? Where am I willing to go? And so for so many people, I don't even think it's about so much just standing up against the system or standing up for what's right. Now, if we go back to the civil rights movements back in 1960s, 
it was such a different period of time for our people. You know, it was very, very desperate for our people. We were still fighting for basic rights, you know, the right to vote. We were, we were talking about, you know, trying to get uh, to end segregation. You know, we're still talking about the first person to go to school here, the first person to do that. And it was very, very difficult. And then your commercial break, you know, there was a, an excerpt uh, from the Honorable uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and it was just talking about, uh, you know, the injustices of today and people's willingness to fight. Well, people fight when they're very angry and they almost have nowhere else to go when their backs are pushed against the wall. And during the 1960s, that's when you saw a generation that said, hey, we've seen what our, what our, what our parents went through. We've heard the stories of our ancestors. We're not taking this, and we don't even care anymore. And that's where you see the riot. That's where you see a lot of the people starting to boycott using their economic dollars to pool together. And then the system said, hey, let's be smart about this. We, we, we want to be careful with this. So what did they do? They started to give us a few rights. You know, they opened up different housing uh, for a few of us. And what did that do? You know, you look at the work of William Julius Wilson, a famous sociologist. He talks about when work disappears. He talks about that golden age in the black community where, although we might not have had the tremendous financial prosperity, but because of some of the discrimination with the housing issues, we were all forced to live in the same neighborhood. So you had black doctors, black lawyers, black accountants, black bankers, people who were, you know, prosperous, people who were doing great things inside the neighborhood. Well, we we'll let go right there, Dr. Work. Smith. we got to step aside for a couple of announcements, and we'll come back to you. And we've already got some folks who want to speak to you. You two can join our conversation with Dr. Romel Smith. He's a psychologist with the NBA Milwaukee Bucks, the only black psychologist in the NBA. 800-450-7876 gets you on to speak to him. Your calls after the break on 1450 WOL, where information is power. Moving today or tomorrow and not sure who to call? Well, your worries are over. Ted's Moving and Hauling at 301-254-8221 is your one-stop place to call when you need to move from your apartment, home, or office. Ted's Moving and Hauling is one of the best with experience and professional movers to handle all your needs with no job too large or too small. Ted's can do it all. Call now to find out more. 301-254-8221. That's 301-254-8221. Need something hauled away? Ted can do that too. Ted's Moving and Hauling is one of the best and with some of the best prices in town. So if you need to move uptown, downtown, or out of town, call Ted's Moving and Hauling today at 301-254-8221. That's 301-254-8221. That's Ted's Moving and Hauling, moving you from your home, office, or church. Call Ted's today at 301-254-8221. This is Barbara Armwine. Be sure to tune in to Igniting Change every Tuesday from noon to 1 on WOL 1450 AM. I will provide provocative and empowering information to ignite change and inspire action in achieving racial justice and equality. It really is up to all of us to be and to ignite the change that we so desperately want to see in our neighborhoods, communities, our cities our states, our nation, and the world. Each week, I want you to join me and my special guests to learn how your activism matters in realizing a more just and equal society for all. Ignite change with me every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Together, we can make a difference. Visit BarbaraArnwine.com for more information. And now, and now back, 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 back to the Carl Nelson Show. On Washington, D.C.'s 1450. 1450 WOL Radio. Thanks for staying with us 25 after the hour. Our guest is Dr. Romel Smith. He's the only a blank psychologist in the NBA. He's with the Milwaukee Bucks. i got to ask you about Trayvon Martin. After the Trayvon Martin incident came out, uh, the Miami Heat wanted to do something because Trayvon was from uh, Miami, and, and they, you know, they wanted to show some sort of support uh, for for Trayvon and his family, and we saw what they did. What if, if they came to you? If they were your psychiatrist, and they say, "Doc, we got to do something because this is just you know this is too outrageous," and we think we can make a statement and we can help the situation. What would you advise them to do? You know, the first thing I do whenever you talk about a team and doing something like that, whatever happens, you know, is going to have um, you know effect on the whole team. So the first thing I say, listen, 
we got to make sure, you know, you were in unison. They were in unity. Because if not, you know, that starts to have a whole lot of other problems. Because everybody on board. And once you have everybody on board, I say understand what you're doing, understand the consequences, and understand also, you know, everything that happens after that. Because activism is not a one-time thing. And once you put your foot out there, you understand that you can't take it back. You know, it becomes a process where people will expect you to do something, where people will expect you to say, because they're going to look at the Jim Browns of the world, the Muhammad Ali's, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and say, hey, this is what we've been waiting for. So when you do it, I say, hey, that's great. That's a sign of solidarity. But also I ask them to also with this to say, before you do something and you get swept up away by the emotion of everything, make sure you know the facts. Make sure you know what you're supporting. Because some cases are worthy to support. And some other ones we have to look at and we just have to be real and honest with ourselves and say, is this the one that I want to go behind? And with Trayvon Martin, that was such a, an atrocious uh, crime of American judicial society that you say, hey, fellas, I'm with you here. I appreciate what you're trying to do. This is close to home. We understand the nation is looking. What can we do? And the fact that everybody on social media was changing their Facebook uh, symbols to uh, to wearing a hood, you know, to symbolize solidarity with Trayvon Martin, I thought that was something that was very um, appropriate. And I would tell them, hey, you know, to go for it, but understand that everything that goes with it. And whether I'm talking to a pro athlete or I'm talking to a nine-year-old person, I always give them an f stand scenario. If you do this, then think about what are the possibilities. And you look at when you think about the thing and think about what's the worst case scenario, and you think about the best case scenario, because most of the times we think about what's the best case scenario if we do something. I said, if you're willing to accept everything that comes with the worst case scenario, that's when you know it's in your heart to do it. Because when it comes to activism, it's not a game. And you have to understand that you have to be willing to die. And people say, whoa, 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 hold on. But that's really what it boils down to. If you look at Muhammad Ali, he was willing to die for his cause. And even though he didn't physically die, his career died for three years. You know, his financial situation died for three years of what he could have did if he would have went along with the plan. But because he was so convicted, he was willing to take whatever comes along with it. And I think that's what we have to ask ourselves, whether, like I said, it's a, a young, small child or a professional athlete. Are you willing for the worst-case scenario? And if you are, then go full speed. But if not, you know, rethink your decision. So, so do you tell them, do you, do, you, do you help them navigate through the NBA? So, because you know that the NBA, the NBA's got some rules. They've got their image to protect. Do you help them say, well, this, go, this would go too far, or stop it right here, or, or, or this is cool? Or do you say, hey, you know, got, fellas, whatever you feel like, you know, just go. No, no, no. You know, as a psychologist, uh, you don't give advice, you don't tell people what to do. What you help them to do is to illuminate the situation so they can make the, the decision themselves. You know, we talk about the NBA, but even at the end of the day, whether they're 19 years old or 30 years old, they are emancipated, so they're legally adults. They have um, a great deal of knowledge uh, from the world because a 19-year-old in the NBA is not the same as a 19-year-old that's in college because the world has forced them to grow up in a different type of manner. So what I try to do is sometimes with younger people, as you know, we, we can be a little irrational. We can be a little, you know, um, quick to make a decision. And so what I try to get people to do is just to slow down and to think. Because once you think, then you can you can make a rational decision. And then what after that, you can do whatever it is you want to do. So start telling the person, do this or don't do that. That's not my job because then they become dependent on me. Part of my job is to help them to become strong, independent men, to think for themselves, but just to know how to critically think, how to be uh, socially aware, socially conscious. But like I said, understanding the ramifications not only upon them, but upon those people within the inner circle whom they love, and also the organization whom they represent and the NBA and that shield and everything of that matter. So when, you, when you're working for a company, it doesn't matter. You work for Xerox, if you work for uh, McDonald's as a brand, that whenever you um, hold, you, you're a part of a company, you do have to consider those uh, those uh, people's feelings, those actions, and the, the effect it can have on them. And then you have to decide what you want to do. And there's been some people who's left the league, you know, because they wanted, they felt so strongly about their convictions and thought they were being held um, down. But they said, hey, I'll do my own thing. And you have nothing but respect for that, but you understand, you know, obviously the financial ramifications. 
And then there's been some people who say, you know what I'll do? I'll I'll be quiet, but I'll I'll financially support in a low way. So what you try to do is just help people figure out what's their way. You know, obviously, by the way, I try to live my life. I try to live it in a way in which I, I speak strong. And uh, what I say is what I do. My word is bond. And then um, I think the best example in, this, in whatever you do is try to be a living testimony, you know, that walking epistle. So um, when, when, you, when you do speak, your words have a lot more weight because they can believe in them, because they see you doing what you say. All right, 30 minutes after the hour. Uh, but before we take off, just to remind folks, is, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has written a great article about this in Time Magazine. Uh, it's about the importance of athlete uh, activists. That's the title of it. He says, the genie's out of the locker. And no amount of ace bandages will bind him back to mutinous. So he says, the black athlete is now ready to speak up. What are your thoughts? 800-450-7876, line one. Real brother calling us from Los Angeles. Real brother, you're on with Dr. Smith. You're on with Dr. Smith. Okay, thank you for having me uh, on the show program. Thank you for taking my call. All right, uh, my question, my issue with black PhDs is that they are trained by white PhDs. And white people, on the whole, believe that white people are superior and that the problem is black people are degenerate and inferior by nature, by culture. How can a black PhD go out into the world and help black people when they are taught by whites who have taught them that there's a system of white supremacy, that white people are superior and can put their racism into systems and institutions. How can black PhDs be effective when they were taught to only psychoanalyze black people because the problem is black people and not the white people that have been oppressing them and enslaving them for 450 years? That is my first question. All right, let's give him a chance to respond. Dr. Smith? Hey, no, no, you know what, that's that, you know, a question, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of truth. I, I can't remember, we're hang up on Real Brother because we're getting a feedback oh. there. But go ahead, Dr. Smith. Okay. Okay, no, 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 no. What he says is very, very valid, but, you know, you, you have to think about who you're talking to, so you can't put everybody in one scenario whenever we say all people, because first of all, I wasn't trained by all white people, so I can only speak for me in this standpoint. I was trained by Dr. Festus Obiaku, who was from Nigeria, Dr. Edgar Epps, who's a world-famous uh, sociologist from Chicago, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Marvin. And um, as I talk about that, is I had three black men on my dissertation committee, and they were all full tenure professors. And so, so um, that, that's that's one fallacy that he has. And two, you know, when I was in um, in um, grade, I mean, excuse me, in undergraduate, I was given a book called *The Miseducation of the Negro* by Carter G. Woodson. And uh, that book is very near and dear to me because Carter G. Woodson is uh, um, the founder of what we call Black History Month now, but was Negro um, Achievement History Week. And, um, and the, the, the irony of that book is he talks about the same thing that Real Brother talked about, you know, that you can be brainwashed. So even though that you may have it colored, you've been trained by a system to do that. So one of the things my mind was always forced was not to be led astray by a system. And like I said, the world that I grew up in, I didn't need a white person to tell me that my, my people were a certain way because I knew the truth. I knew where we came from. I'd been taught by my parents. I'd been taught by a neighborhood that although we may have been financially poor, was strong in racial pride, strong in cultural pride, and allowed me to see, you know, the best of us, even when sometimes the media, the propaganda, the media showed the worst of us. So first you had to think about who you're talking to. And so as I talk about what I do there, you know, I let my, my actions speak for myself. I'm, I'm very active in my community. I'm very active with what I do. And I don't think there's anything that I said that has fit into the propaganda of the media, uh, the, of the propaganda of what we would call, you know, the institutional uh, white racism uh, that somehow can be uh, infused into some of our African Americans inside the school. So we have to make sure that we, we understand who we're talking to. Uh, you, you All right. Hold that thought, uh, uh, Dr. Smith. I'll let you finish on the other side. We have a news update coming. Yeah. Folks, you two can get in a discussion with Dr. Mel Smith from the Milwaukee Bucks. He's the only black psychologist in the NBA. We'll take your phone calls for him after the news update on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. 
Good morning. I'm Mike Fortier. Here's the latest from NewsOne.com, brought to you in part by Unbound. Unbound sponsorship fights poverty by strengthening human connections and nurturing interdependency. That's just one way. Unbound is different. Learn more at Unbound.org. Two buildings on Georgetown's campus with connections to slavery will be renamed. The university announcing that Mullity Hall and McSherry Hall will be renamed Freedom Hall and Remembrance Hall until new permanent names are selected. Thomas Mullity and William McSherry, former Georgetown presidents who directly oversaw slave sales, helped pay off the school's debt in the 1830s. On Friday, a small group of students protested the building names by staging a sit-in in the Georgetown president's office. Commuters on Metro will see increased security for the unforeseen future. Residents can expect more canine units sweeping through stations and random bag checks. Metro Transit Police Chief Ronald Pavlik says there will also be random surges of police police officers patrolling around peak hours. This comes after a video released by ISIS that directly threatens the district. Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe looking into the possibility that refugees from Syria may have to be resettled in Virginia. The governor's office says it's in communication with federal authorities about possible locations to house the refugees. McAuliffe ensuring the people of Virginia that all precautions will be taken to ensure safety to the public. A memorial to victims of the Paris attacks growing outside the French embassy. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser joining the throngs of people showing their support yesterday by placing flowers outside the embassy building in Georgetown. People placing flowers on the sidewalk since late Friday night. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan says he's cancer-free. Hogan announcing that after undergoing further tests yesterday morning, he learns he's 100% cancer-free and in complete remission. Hogan battling non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for months. He says he'll continue to undergo tests. This report brought to you in part by Unbound. Unbound sponsorship fights poverty by strengthening human connections and nurturing interdependency. That's just one way Unbound is different. Learn more at Unbound.org. I'm Mike Fortier. When you're looking for news for Black America, go to NewsOne.com. Good morning. This traffic update is brought to you by Lead Safe America. We'll start with the early morning accident 50 westbound at Kenilworth Avenue. It looks like the accident caused some issues earlier this morning. It's now moved off to the right shoulder. However, your delays start from Garden City Drive. DC 295 stop and go southbound from Eastern to East Capitol. Also, we have an accident on the BW Parkway heading southbound just before 410 involving a couple of cars. Your delays are starting to build there. Thinking about renovating that beautiful old house? Don't poison your kids. Test for lead to learn how to make your house safe. Go to LedSafeAmerica.com. This weather update is brought to you by the Foundation for a Better Life. Winston Churchill's words stirred his country in the face of defeat. Today, they inspire us to reach for our own victories. Commitment, pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at Values.com. Today, cooler with clouds and sun. Highs reach in the mid-60s. Tonight, mostly cloudy skies, lows near 50. Right now, it's 47 degrees. I'm Tony Thornton for News Talk 1450 WOL, where information is power. Talk radio in the AM. The number one morning show. The number one on everybody list. Carl Nelson on 1450 WOL. As I mentioned, he's the only, the only African American psychologist in the NBA. Dr. Smith, I'm going to let you finish up uh, responding to what Big Real Brother said, and then we'll take some more calls for you. Yeah, you know, I just, uh, you know, I'll finish with this point, not to belabor the point, but, you know, when you talk about, you know, who's a person teacher, you have to see who's the real teacher. Because um, just because you're uh, formally educated doesn't mean that you're not educated outwardly. And uh, one of the things I did when I first got into uh, this whole sports realm, I reached out to two people. Uh, and that's Dr. Harry Edwards and Dr. Todd Boyd, two very prominent African-American people that, that are very uh, well-known within the sports field. And uh, these two brothers, you know, sat down, you know, told me the ropes as far as, you know, how to navigate um, the world of sports, um, you know, doing things the right way, being socially conscious, understanding, helping all the players. And uh, to, to the uh, to caller's point, you know, I don't only work with black players. You know, the NBA has white players. The NBA has uh, uh, international players. So going to a, a white institution, it has some benefit in that way because uh, you, you learn the mainstream system. So it's like when, that, when people say they're only African-American psychologists. It doesn't mean I can only work effectively, you know, with, with African American. Um, I like to think that uh, my, my range um, and, and diversity to be able to, to touch people in a special way uh, goes far beyond some of these uh, demographics that we put on, uh, demographics and labels that we put on people. All right, cool. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned Dr. Harry Edwards uh, and San Jose State because this with Tom, Tom Smith and uh, John Collis were from yeah, in, yeah, in the yeah, State yeah, Olympics. Yeah. Right. 
In the 68 Olympics uh, in Mexico City, and and they had a meeting, and this, you know, with Jim Brown and Kareem, and they and they were deciding whether or not what they should do, and it ended up at that meeting just like you said. They decided, well, everybody do what do what you feel, because uh, from what I understand, it was sort of spontaneous. They they didn't leave the meeting. Jim Jim was sort of advising them with, with Harry Edwards, and Kareem decided he wasn't going to participate, and they replaced him on on the basketball team with Spencer Haywood. And, and ironically, that's the same Olympics that um, the boxer. Uh, George Foreman. Uh, I was just going to talk about that. You know, you look at the juxtaposition between, you know, black power statement uh -huh. and then somebody who wants to um, acclimate inside the, uh, you know, uh, the right. George Foreman. And, and, yeah. and you know what? It's, it, it, that's just the whole thing. And so when we talk about the athlete, the black athlete, it's a diversity. It's a range. You know, it's not like they're a monolith. It's not as though it's a homogeneous group that everybody has the same mindset. So you have one person who wants to show solidarity within uh, the black community to say, I appreciate the struggle, understand what's going on. But at the same time, you have a young man who has experienced all of the same hardships. So they're going to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to try to be a patriot. I'm going to try to see it and do it that way. And, you know, it's no different. Uh, then, then, you know, the great Langston Hughes, when he wrote the poem, you know, I too am America. You know, he said, you know, they, you know what, they're going to put me in the back room in the kitchen when company well, comes well, in. Well, let me interrupt so when I ask you this then. Uh, when, 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 uh, cause I know in my neighborhood, when, 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 when George Foreman did that with the flag, I mean, people just yeah, did yeah. it. He, he, he got the Tom <laughs> tag for life after that. <laughs> he, he sure did. And that's why when Ali had beat him, it was such a thing as though Ali had to resonate <laughs> With, with the black people, not only of America, but with Africa as being that where, where George hadn't caught that same type of uh, reputation, even though he was a ferocious boxer and very good at what he did. He never won the hearts of the people because of that action, but he won the hearts of some people. And that was on, on, you know, the other side of America. And so when you look at that, this is what I tell people. Everybody has their own journey. Everybody has their own plot. What's important to you may not be important. It's something we have to understand that we, we, we may not like it, but we have to understand that everybody has their own their own mission in life. We would like to see people uh, to be more conscious. So when we talk about, you know, the young athlete today, it's not only the young athlete, it's, it's the young people we would like to see more socially conscious. So I don't think that it's just the, the, the athlete that's not, um, you know, kind of rearing up the heads of activism, but it's a, a lot of young people who, who are kind of slow to do it. And then until recently, and what happened? We talked about the 1960 movement where we said we're sick of this. Well, if you listen to some of the tapes of Farrakhan today, and then you listen to some of the tapes of, of Martin Luther King, of Malcolm X, of the 1960s, it seems like we're in a time warp, like we're seeing the same thing. And what happened in the 60s when, when all of this was going on? Why you got the, the riots, uh, riots, the, the riots in Watson and other various uh, cities in Detroit and, and New York and, and um, Chicago, because people were sick and tired, and now it's getting to that same point. And even now, you'll see athletes, uh, you know, doing some of the kind of ceremonial things, you know, uh, as putting up the black uh, uh, hand power fist. But now you may wear a shirt that says, I can't breathe, or Black Lives Matter, things of that thing to let people know I am conscious, I am I am um, involved with this in some form or some fashion. All right. Uh, 18 away from the top there. Let's go to line two. Joseph's joining us from Boston. Joseph, you're on with Dr. Smith. Good morning, Carl. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Good morning, sir. Yeah, I got um, I'll tell you exactly what our problem is, how how we could advance as black people, but we are stuck on stupid. Uh, Carl, I hope you give me a chance to give you a full personal example. I like to deal with real stories. I'm a nonfiction type of guy. There's a lot of great athletes that's doing a lot of great things. But the problem is we think from a micro point of view instead of macro point of view, like say John Carlos and Tommy Smith days. We try to influence from the local level. That does nothing for the black race or the black people. I'm an athlete. I've been an athlete all my life, track and field mainly. And I ran across a lot of great guys that did a lot of great things for society, but it's just not good enough for the whole black race. Let me give you four quick people that I came close to that made a big difference. First, you had Derek Atkins. Derek Atkins won gold medal in the 400-meter hurdle. Well, I didn't know him personally, but we 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 represented Long Island in the Empire State game together. Uh, he ran the gold medal in the 400-meter hurdle in the Atlanta Olympics. Uh, his sister, I followed his sister career for a long while. She ran to, she went to Texas Southern University, great sprinter, but personal reasons. 
that his son comes cool. Her parents, their parents were very involved from um, Baldwin, Long Island, next to Union, historical, rich black neighborhood. He right now coaches and do after school tutoring, edu- tutoring for kids in New York City public school athletic league. And, um, yeah, yeah Joseph, to- put it on the fast track. Uh, okay, We've got a bunch of folks uh, want to speak to Doctor Smith. <laughs> Is Joseph there? I think he hung up. Eight hundred four five zero seventy eight seven six. Go to line one. Tabakuti's joined us from Atlanta. Tabakuti, you're on with Doctor Smith. I, I just want to get your I just want to get your thought on uh, what do you think about well okay I did not come into my African consciousness until I moved to California and I attended the uh, the Long Beach Study Group where was a group of African centered people studying our culture and I re- I remember reading this guy uh, the guy from uh, what's this uh, his name is Stokely uh, I can't, uh, Mint Condition I think the name of the band yeah Mint Condition oh, yeah Stokely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I was doing some research and, and was reading how that band was able to stay together because of the the root that was instilled in Stokely from yes, all of those great scholars being yes, yes, right, sir. all those great scholars being around his father and, him, and who his father is. And so, I just want to get your take of what do you think? Because I know now it doesn't. Some people are still going to stray because see, Nate Dog, he used to come. His brother would come to. The Long Beach Study Group, he would buy up all the tapes, all the videos, all the stuff of the scholars that came through there. Now, oh, I hear your drums on call. Yeah, yeah, hang on, Tabakuti. we got to take a quick break. 800-450-7876. You two can join this conversation with Dr. Smith from the NBA Milwaukee Bucks. Check your calls next as the big show rolls on from 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. Do you want a greener D.C.? I do. I'm Edith Shipley, a Pepco customer in Southeast. And I have solar panels because I want more clean energy and because they help me save money. That's also why I support the Pepco Holdings Exelon merger. It'll bring $7 million for renewable energy and energy efficiency programs to the district. And the merger will make it easier for customers like me to connect our solar panels to the electric grid. I'm Mark Davis, owner of WDC Solar in Anacostia. The merger will help customers like Edith add renewable energy to their homes. It will also significantly expand solar energy in D.C. and add more than $10 million for the district's Green Building Fund. It's why Edith and I signed the petition supporting the merger. Add your name at PHITomorrow.com. The Pepco Holdings Exelon Merger. Affordability, reliability, and sustainability for D.C. Paid for by Exelon Corporation. Attention Medicare beneficiaries, this year's open enrollment from October 15th through December 7th. Consider MedStar Medicare Choice, a $0 monthly premium Medicare Advantage plan brought to you by the local doctors and nurses of MedStar Health. Visit MedStarMedicareChoice.com or call 855-321-3697. Again, that's 855-321-3697. You must continue to pay your Medicare Part B premium. Speak in person with an enrollment specialist at the MedStar Medicare Choice Express. November 18th at Hattie Home Senior Wellness Center in Northwest D.C. Confessions of a Potentially Perfect Parent, brought to you by AdoptUsKids.org. Okay, here goes. I know more about cooking dinner for a party of 12 than I do about packing a lunch for a 12-year-old. I know kids like things like PB&J, pigs in a blanket. Oh, and fish sticks. They do love fish sticks. Filets I get, but sticks? What part of the fish does the stick come from? I know I can read a cookbook that'll tell me how to make a red wine reduction. But where are the cookbooks that can teach me how to cut the crusts off bologna sandwiches? Oh, maybe we can compromise on mac and cheese. Can you make that with brie? But everybody likes brie, right? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to push your food around their plate. Call 1-888-200-4005 or visit adoptuskids.org for more information. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt Us Kids, and the Ad Council. You wanted to be a teacher when you were little, but as you grew up, things changed. Teaching just didn't seem like the best option anymore, so you decided to become something else. But what would your 12-year-old self say? Interesting and innovative things are happening in teaching today, so it's time to put it back on your list. Don't try to convince yourself otherwise. You had it right the first time. 
Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Your voice can now be heard. Y'all ready? Yeah. Yeah. With Carl Nelson weekdays from 6 to 10 a.m. on 1450 WOL. And then you with us 10 away from the top. Yeah, we'll get back to Dr. Smith in a moment. Just want to remind you that Dick Gregory is going to join us uh, later to talk about uh, what happened in Paris. Also, Dr. Frances Chris Wilson is going to be here after Greg, and she, she's going to discuss about the, the, the campus uprising, if you will, in Missouri. And it's, can the black bourgeoisie, and some people use that as a majority, but, you know, can the black upper class, can they identify with the urban struggle? Also, later this week, Dr. Donna Murch is going to uh, continue the discussion about the uprising on the on the black students on college campuses. It's been dormant for a while, and all of a sudden now, it's been a resurgence, and the whole old heads have been like, hey, good, we're about time. Also, Craig Hewlett is going to be here. We're going to get more of what's going on internationally, how we, how the United States fits into this new paradigm, and who's at the top now, is it, whether it's China or what's going on in Syria, and the bombing, of course, in uh, in Paris. And also the man with the plan, Dr. Claude Anderson is going to be here. He's the only one who's got a plan specifically for black folks. So keep it locked right here on 1450 WOL. Let's go back to Dr. Smith. Tambacuti, are you still with us? Um, I'll wrap it up real quick. So, yeah, what I want to ask you is that uh, as far as like having like uh, this uh, Dr. Cabal, he's out of New York and he's in this uh, video series in Colors. Now, he has an excellent syllabus that I have gotten. I've been sharing with different people, letting them know that, look, if you give your child this information, it could change the way they think and the way they do things. So I just want to get your responses, and I can listen to it off the air. What do you think about having more of these uh, study groups or community centers where the community can go because there are a large number of us don't know who we are, don't know where we came from. They don't feel any connection to any black people in any other part of the world. And I feel that if we could kind of break that, that would move us in a different direction where we will be able to do things and move more upward versus all kind of ways that people are moving nowadays. And I'll listen to your response off the air. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that question is answered itself. You stated it so, you know, articulately and so eloquently. Um, everything starts with the knowledge itself. It's not until you truly know yourself and you love yourself the beautiful things happen. And when we talk about, you know, the atrocity of what's happened to us from the middle passes on, it's always been a way to remove us from our from our natural name, from our natural language, our natural way of working, which was in a collectivist rather than an individualistic manner. Also, you know, from our religion. There were so many things that were stolen from us. So we're working always from behind. So we like, how do we teach ourselves what we need to know, specifically with our, our, our culture being so very heavy in the oral tradition so many things were lost. So many things were taken away. So it's paramount that what we do is we get all of the information that we do have. We get all the stuff that we're trying to start, we're trying to do, and to build up that positive self-confidence, that positive self-concept, that self-esteem. Because the truth of the matter is this, Brother Carl, you can only give out what you have in. So the more that we can put in knowledge, the more that we can put in love, the more that we can put in that ferocious attitude where you speak truth to power, the more you're going to have a greater uh, individual, a greater family, a greater community, and greater society at large. So, yes, it starts at home, and it starts early before the propaganda of the outside side world can come in and to try to destroy those thieves and kill those dreams and kill those kids before they grow. And, Tabba Cootie, thank you for your call. Uh, seven away from the top of the hour. Dr. Smith, if, you know, a lot of people celebrate Michael Jordan for what he does on the basketball court. It obviously, he's a very talented individual when it comes to athletics. But he seems to be lacking social consciousness. If he, if he was on your team and you know he, he could make a difference, we've seen LeBron step up, and all of a sudden uh, to, uh, Kobe's sort of uh, you know grown into some sort of consciousness. And he's made it incremental, but it's still moving in the right direction. But if you're on a team with Michael Jordan and, and he could make a difference, would you nudge him into that way, or would you just leave him alone? Because you know people were going to, to Michael Jordan and say, "Hey, Mike, you need to talk about this. You need to talk about that." And in fact, um, one of the other fellows on the Chicago Bulls, he got got ran out of the league for for, for being so militant. Even though uh, he wasn't as militant, he was just trying to urge or, or push Michael in a way that uh, to use his clout because he had a lot of clout with the Bulls when he was playing, and uh, Michael resisted. But I'm just saying, if if he was, if you had a player that uh, caliber on your team. And you know he could make a difference. Would you sort of push him or direct him into that direction, or would you just leave him alone to his own vices? 
Yeah, I, I can't speak to Michael because I don't know him. I don't know what he does. Sometimes people lead in different ways, so it could be some things that he does, you know, behind the scenes where he helps out in, in different ways where he don't. I don't know, so I can't, it's hard for me to speak on him. But it's right, not him personally, but if you had a, a, a caliber, uh, yeah. if you had a LeBron, mm-hmm. and, you know, that's not the person, if we just throw out the, the name, but an a, a yeah, influential a uh, a player school. on the team. Yeah, you, you know what, I, I think that's the, the duty of all mankind, though. And I think it's to talk about the atrocities of all issues. So if I have a player, um, of course, being a, a black man, that's something that, that's very, very important to me. But I speak out on the atrocities of all things. I think if you have a voice or a power to do something, it is your obligation and your duty to do so. So, you know, we talk about that. But we also have horrific things in the world it's like human trafficking. I'm going to encourage that person to talk about it against all roles. You know, Dr. King said uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we can't just pick and choose the battles that we want. So I talk about a person who has that power, that ability, that authority to do everything. You know, we can even talk about that with President Barack Obama. You know, people say, oh, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. Well, I don't know exactly what the full, you know, duties of his job is, but I appreciate the, the, the weight and the burden. You know, he's sitting under the sword of democracy in that office with pressures nobody understands and nobody can do. So for someone to criticize him, without fully knowing that it is a big thing. So, But what I would tell the president is, hey, you have to be the leader of all people, protect all people. So not just protecting one um, issue of concern, but all issues of concern. And I, and I you know, I just give a shout out to the president because I think he has done so many things and being in the position that he is, it's, it's a lot. You say, could he could have done better? Maybe so. You know, I don't know. But I know he's had a tremendous weight, and, and I like what he's doing as he do it. And, uh, you know, I, I speak to this because today is a special day for me just on a personal basis. Um, I'm a member of a fraternity called Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, and our fraternity was founded here in Washington, D.C. at Howard uh, University. And part of that whole position, um, our, our cardinal principles are manhood, scholarship, perseverance, and uplift. And I don't think you have to be a member for a fraternity to live up to cardinal principles such as that. So when I talk to the young men, as far as your responsibility to be a man, you have to speak up for all injustices. You know, you have to challenge your mind to, to sharpen your mind in all ways possible. And then you have to persevere through the through the hard times and you have to uplift, you know, the next generation, those who are above you, those who are below you as far as from an age status. So when you say, what would I tell that person? I say, hey, if you have a voice and you can do something, I would encourage them to use it. But use it in a way in which it's befitting up on them because everybody's not a warrior. You have to understand that. But everybody can't fight in a different way. All right, hold on for right there. We'll traffic up there coming next. Uh, Dr. Yes, Romel sir. Smith is our guest. 800 450 7876. We're taking phone calls for Dr. Smith after this traffic update on 1450. W O L, where information is power. Good morning. This traffic update is brought to you by the Foundation for a Better Life. We'll start with Beltway Delay is now jammed up on the Outer Loop from 95 as you make your approach to Georgia Avenue. The accident activity cleanup continues now on 50 westbound at Kenilworth Avenue. Moved off to the right shoulder there, but your delays start from Garden City Drive. BW Parkway southbound just before 410. We also have an accident that's causing delays starting from the Beltway. Winston Churchill's words stir this country in the face of defeat. Today they inspire us to reach for our own victories. Commitment. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at Values.com. This weather update is brought to you by Unbound. At Unbound, they believe in the potential of an educated child to change the life of her family, her community, and our world. Learn more at unbound.org. Today, cooler with clouds and sun highs reaching the mid 60s. Mostly cloudy tonight, lows near 50. Right now, some clouds and 47 degrees. I'm Tony Thornton for News Talk 1450 WOL, where information is power. What's wrong, Tina? Where are you coming from? I am just coming from the dealership getting my Mercedes-Benz service. Do you know it cost me $500? $500? Girl, you should have gone to Magic Benz in Hyattsville. Their A services are only $250, and B services start at just $250. They are my premier specialist and have up to 40% off dealer prices and 100, yes, 100% satisfaction guaranteed. But how did I miss this? But there is more. They offer professional services, 
tire replacement, balance and rotation, engine cooling system flush, body work for all Mercedes, and more. Their oil changes are only $99. Michelle, say no more. What's their info? It's Magic Benz at 4716 Baltimore Avenue, Hyattsville, Maryland. Their number is 301-985-2676 or go to their website at magicbenzservice.com. Thank me later. No, I am thanking you now. Like the taste of fresh apples? Try an Angry Orchard hard cider. At Angry Orchard, we believe in tradition. That's why we use apples from a 100-year-old orchard. It takes two apples to make each bottle of Angry Orchard. So raise a glass to a time when apples were best served in a pint glass. Angry Orchard, when you're looking for something a little different, crisp, refreshing, and not too sweet, just like me. Angry Orchard hard cider. Branch out. Angry Orchard Cider Company, Cincinnati, Ohio. Drink responsibly. I can make an impact in the world. As young people think that we can't make a difference, but not only we can make a difference, but sometimes we can make the biggest difference. We wanted to be the doers and we wanted to be the changers. You just have to find something that you're passionate about and use your talents and your abilities to volunteer. Volunteering doesn't have to be a chore. It really is a reward in itself. It helps you get farther in life. There is no better feeling than helping somebody else. You can see one person smile. You can tell they needed that smile. And it can really change and open up your heart to new things. A lot of things are really competitive it's about individual achievement. Volunteering is a way to take a step back from that. See a need, gather friends, and change the world. Changing someone's world. It happens now. This is the time. And this is when you learn, so why not start? Are you a young volunteer making a difference? Apply for the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. Visit spirit.prudential.com. WOL Washington, WPRS HD2 Waldorf, WKYS HD2 Washington, WMMJ HD2 Bethesda, celebrating 35 years of service to the community where information is power. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Incorporated, or their management. Welcome to the Carl Nelson Show on Washington, D.C.'s 1450 WOL Radio and live around the world on WOLDCnews.com. My name is Daniel Sportsman. I'm telling you, speaking with Dick Gregory, but I'm now with Dr. Ronell Smith. He's the only black psychologist in the NBA world from the Milwaukee Bucks. And before we uh, left for the traffic, you, were, you mentioned President Obama. And, you know, many of us tend to think that athletes are more liberal than the, the greatest society. And during the uh, during the presidential race, saw a lot of white athletes who came out for Romney and and, and spoke disparagingly of, of the president. A lot of people say, "Wait a minute," because you know because they interact and associate with with uh, blacks closer than probably most people do when when you're playing sports. Uh, did you find that interesting, or or, or did because you you're a psychologist, so you deal with black and white athletes. So, you know, they have preconceived ideas of, about the races. Did, did you find that interesting, or, or was, it, was it surprising to you? Nothing surprises me in America. So, you know, you, you understand that. And I think that's what, uh, you know, from the original question we got from the real brother, you know, when he's talking about, you know, when you – how can a black Ph.D. who's trained by white Ph.D.s keep his, his black mind, so to speak? And I think when you live in a society and you've been uh, fed a certain propaganda forever, um, it's hard uh, for you to think certain things different, um, you know, but at the end of the day, it always goes back to, I, I think, the words of Martin Luther King, so, so credible, you know, don't judge a man by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. And when you start to look at people's character, regardless uh, of the color, you can see ignorance, you can see, you know, um, racism, you can see some type of a uh, level of arrogance, um, hegemonic thinking. And so with that, you know, you just have to you know, put ignorance where it is and just say, hey, listen, look at where this man is at. Look at what he's done, you know, for the nation. And then you let the facts speak. So I don't, I don't argue with people with facts. You know, opinions are debatable. But when you can put facts in the air, I let them stand where they may and then let people argue against the wall. All right. Uh, and to Gregory's joined us at, uh, what is it, at three after the hour. Greg, uh, welcome back to uh, WL Radio. Yeah. Yeah. By everything but racism, hmm? we're going to look and try to solve all the problems. Black people can get shot in the head on camera, and you got those same white networks. When you got that white guy lied and, and committed suicide but said it was two Mexicans and one black, 
not one white station and two black stations said, well, look, I wonder if that, that two weeks they was looking for them, how many of them got jacked up? How many people got snatched out the car? It's like it didn't happen. Oh, okay, he committed suicide. That's crap. You know, on Carl's show, when it first came through, I said, wait, ho, 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 ho. Here is a white lieutenant, a 30-year veteran. What's he doing walking the beat at 8 o'clock in the morning? Are y'all crazy? What Come on, make doing? it make sense. You hear what I'm saying? And then all at once, and I think about this here, all at once when the autopsy come back, and this is a white dude, this is their friend. He said, well, it looked like it was more like uh, uh, suicide than homicide. Man, them white nasty police start talking about, he need to be fired. He can't say that. And nobody said, wait a minute. You know, damn good and well, the police department, those unions ain't nothing but full of crap, just like the the the, the, the automobile unions and all them, a bunch of gangsters, and all they're doing is hustling and going through the change. You could see the question nobody asks, we got thousands of black cops. How come you never pick up the paper, turn on TV, and see some black cop Okay, shooting some white dude or some mother crying and black cops shot my son in the back 40 times. You think because they're more spiritual? You think it's because they're better? No, they know white folks ain't going to tolerate it. And so we sit and we look and they talk all around. They get that Negro piece of dirt out of Milwaukee. And every time something happens, they bring him up. And it's always, yeah, man, you know, that's where I'm from. So we hear that, and we are at, we're absolutely embarrassed by that man. And his thoughts does not represent the thoughts of our uh, black Milwaukee. I put that on on the record right now. But they don't bring him on for black folks. They bring him on uh, for well, white folks. Oh yeah, that, that's what folks have to do. They have to say what they want to say, but they have to bring it to a face that they can say it through, so they don't get the the, the backlash. Not that they really care, but they sure. think that helps drive the point in. I mean, you look at Al Sharpton. When when Al Sharpton is the most powerful black person in America, because of what? The TV show, White Network, five days a week, Radio One, Black Negative, Black Network, five days a week. That was his power. So when anything happened in New York with a cop, when a black person, they get Al, and they bring him out. And he talks, 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 and he makes white folk mad, but... And then all at once, when that black cop was killed in New York and the family wanted Al to come and speak, the police said no. Al ain't opened up his mouth. When the Pope came here, the only place he went where there were black folks, because that whole charade wasn't nothing but white supremacy at its best, a bunch of old white men, no white women, no young white men. And and when he went to that black school in Harlem and Al wasn't invited, huh? But when he wants when they want him to be the flunky and come out and talk about the black person and the cop, that's okay. And so somewhere you stop and you think about it, you say, Wait a minute, hold it. Hmm? What is it? What is it that here not one black Dinkins the the, the only black mayor in New York he wasn't invited. Now, maybe they was out of town. Al wasn't out of town. Right. So I'm, I'm saying when you stop and look, we skirt around everything we skirt around. We don't want to talk about racism. We don't talk about want to talk about this. We don't want to talk about And that's all it is. America is the most racist, insane. Right, well, Greg, let, let me ask Dr. Smith this. Dr. Smith is a psychologist, at Greg, with, with the NBA Milwaukee Bucks. In fact, he's the only black psychologist in the NBA. Not, as a psychologist, Dr. Smith, why don't you think America wants to discuss racism? Well, because it's the, it's the ugly truth that they tried to hide and tried to run away from. You know, to, to talk about uh, Brother Gregory's point, uh, you know, when, when the violence is, is enacted upon our, our people, upon our people, whether it's on a, in a single incident or on a large scale level, what they want us to do, they always say preach nonviolence. 
You know, it's like they can be violent, but when we react in violence, you know, it's a problem. And so that goes back to the whole thing. It's about what we do, what we're going to do, because it benefits us. But if anybody else tries to do it, well, we don't want it. You know, and it goes to the to the old saying that's so so horribly true. You know, during the time of enslavement, I just say that for lack of better words, we all had jobs. Now you look at today where we can't have jobs because it doesn't benefit uh, society at large to have it. It's all about that. You know, it's all about the status quo. It's all about the power, keeping power. And power is never going to give anything uh, itself up. So when you start talking about people who want to have power, why would they do anything to give a group that they have oppressed, a group that they have seemingly under the thumb, any type of power to do it? And any time somebody wants to stand up and do right, what they want to do is automatic, automatically make yeah. you feel as though you are militant. So it's not Right, but why, why can't we have a discussion on race? Actually, well, hang on, I'm, I'm Dr. Smith and Greg, stay with us. To make sure we have it. When they say no, we say yes. Okay, because we got to take a quick break for a traffic update here. 800-450-7876 calls next after the traffic update on 1450. WOL, where information is power. This traffic update is brought to you by the Foundation for a Better Life. We have police activity now on South Capitol Street over the Douglas Bridge. The right lane is closed there, so use caution. 50 westbound at Kenilworth Avenue. The accident activity now moved off to the right shoulder, but the residual delays continue from Garden City Drive and slow on the outer loop from 95 to Georgia Avenue. Winston Churchill's words stirred his country in the face of defeat. Today they inspire us to reach for our own victories. Commitment, pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at Value. Lows near 50. Some clouds right now in 48 degrees. I'm Tony Thornton for News Talk 1450 WOL, where information is power. Looking for a caterer to cater your next event? One that's professional, prepares great tasting food, provides a professional staff, and will create tailor-made menus and services to fit your needs and budget and so much more? Then you have to call a Touch of Class Caterers at 301-449-2082. For 18 years, a Touch of Class has been one of the Washington metropolitan area's premier caterers, providing you nothing but the best for your next event. So whether it's a wedding, rehearsal dinner, church function, repast celebration, or just a private dinner for two, and you want a little more class and elegance to make the day even more special, call a Touch of Class Caterers today at 301-449-2082 and let them take care of the intimate details. That's a touch of class caterers, ready to handle your next event with a touch of class and elegance. Call them today, 301-449-2082, or log on to www.we-cater-2u.com. Those of us who were around in the 50s and 60s struggling, many of us have gotten tired, and we let the enemy have his way. Well... I did my best, they'll say, and you all take it now. I'm just going to sit down and relax or retire. I have never seen a lion retire from being a lion. I may not bite as hard as I used to, but I can still bite. Don't miss the Farrakhan Speaks broadcast this and every Sunday at 8 a.m. until 9 a.m. right here on WOL 1450 a.m. where information is power. That's the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on the air this Sunday at 8 a.m. If you missed last Sunday's message, you have to hear him this Sunday. Don't miss it. Real Talk Radio in the AM. Carl Nelson on 1450 WOL. I understand with us 13 after the hour. Dr. Smith, I know you got to run, but before you go, tell us about the title of your book, because I understand you've got a new book which you've written, uh, co authored. And how, how can folks reach you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the title of the book is called Building a Better Man, and it's just talking about, you know, what we talked here, you know, about earlier when the caller from Atlanta spoke about, you know, uh, what do we have to do to, uh, to to make ourselves a better person? And there's three points. You know, the first one is uh, building interpersonal skills. That means, you know, getting the knowledge of self, having a love of self, understanding what my strengths are, what, what's the avenues for me to be the best person that I can be from just, you know, an individual basis. Then the second eye is interpersonal. That interpersonal skill is how do I, you know, develop and grow relationships? How do I start to know 
who are the people I need to have around me, the people I don't need to have around me, or some of the people that I need to have around me only in situations, knowing how to end a relationship, how to re-engage in a relationship once it's done. And then the last I is involvement. You know, it's about being actively involved where you understand that life is not just about yourself. It's the activism of helping others. Um, my maternal grandmother, as I said at the beginning of the show, she said the best way to heal yourself is to help others. So when we talk about becoming a better person, a better whether it's a man or a woman, just a better individual, it's about that self-knowledge, then being able to navigate relationships that are healthy for you, that's good for you, and then understanding that the world is not just about I and me. It's about us. It's about we and how can I help others. So the book can uh, be bought on Amazon.com. Um, I can be reached at blacksmith.com. Uh, you know, it's just been a pleasure uh, to speak with you, Brother Carl, you too, Brother Gregory. Thank you, my brother. Uh, the, 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 these are the voices that, that helped me, that shaped me as a young person. And it's my, my goal to stand on your shoulders, to stand tall, so the youth of tomorrow can stand on my, my shoulders, but that I do my part in the mission. So that's when it's all said and done. Uh, everything that, that you've done, you know that it wasn't done in vain and that the voices uh, below you that was behind you have heard you and are carrying on that mantle that you've been doing for so long and continue to do. Thank you, my brother. All right. Thank you, Dr. Smith. As I mentioned, Dr.